Ready? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are here today to uh, share some really important scientific information about the tremendous benefits of wearing a mask, which we know is so pivotal in our efforts to reopen our state of Washington. And as I've said, we're making really good progress on that. People are masking up. And today we have new scientific information to share about why that makes uh, even increasing sense. We're joined today by Dr. Joshua Schiffer, who works in as an associate professor for vaccines and infectious diseases at both the Fred Hutchins Center and the University of Washington. Dr. Schiffer has a lot to say about the importance of facial coverings to slowing the spread of COVID-19. And he and his colleagues have been doing some very fascinating research and has new uh, information to share with Washingtonians about the efficacy of masks. Now we, uh, as I talked about uh, last week, are worried about an uptick of COVID activity. But we also know Washingtonians have done a lot that has, keep it, has kept it from becoming much, much worse. And it has become much, much worse in probably 45 other states. And that is because we still see good compliance with our mask order. But as the doctor will explain to us, increasing usage will even uh, knock this, uh, this infection down more. We know that the more you socialize, the closer people work together or study with others, it's even more important to use facial coverings, even in our own homes. So those of us who come into contact with many people, obviously are the most likely who potentially could be super spreaders, like has uh, occurred at the White House. So we know that wearing a mask protects people around you, but we're gonna find out also protects ourselves as well. Both are obviously important. And I just want to comment on this, because I think it is important to address this. Wearing a mask is not a sign of weakness. It is fundamentally a sign of strength. It means you care about your family, you care about your colleagues, you care about your neighbors, and you have the strength to demonstrate that. You don't look strong when you hurt other people. You just kind of look uncaring. So there's another thing about masks that I want to say right at the shot, off the, uh, the starting blocks. A mask is not a sign of party affiliation. And I am so glad that Washingtonians understand that, and that all parties, all people of different political affiliations realize that the virus doesn't care if you're a Republican or an Independent or a Democrat. And all Washingtonians have an opportunity here to save themselves and the people they love. Uh, we know that when, some, when people wear a mask, there's some reduction of COVID transmission. And when more people wear a mask, there's more reduction of that transmission, significantly more. Now, Washingtonians have done a great job on this. We're very, very proud of our state. We've led the state in many ways. Now we're leading the state at the moment in keeping these transmission rates low. But as the weather changes, as we go back indoors, and we resume some of our indoor activities, we really have to increase our commitment uh, to masks. We are already seeing some indications that, uh, that we've had an uptick in some of our uh, uh, infections. We hope that we can get that back down. So at that, I'll have more to say, uh, and we're going to have another important announcement later, but I'd like to defer to Dr. Schiffer uh, for some comments, and then we'll stand for questions. Dr. Schiffer. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Governor Inslee, for the opportunity to speak, and also to Secretary of Health uh, Wiseman. It's, it's really my uh, immense pleasure to, to convey our research, which uh, I, I think really shows how effective masks can be. And I'll emphasize that I'm not wearing a mask now because I'm, I'm working from home today. Uh, but yesterday, uh, in the when I was seeing patients in the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, of course, I was wearing a mask, and we are so grateful that in that work environment, everybody adheres to that, so we can keep our uh, immunocompromised patients safe. So, to, just to start the discussion, I'd like to step back and actually 
talk about the basic epidemiology of how this virus works just for a minute, because that's the context upon which we layer masks. So um, imagine a scenario in which we are doing nothing, in which we're not physically distancing at all, <clears throat> and in which nobody's wearing a mask. The, the virus would spread via exponential growth. And the way we would see that is that the number of cases would double uh, perhaps every three to five days. And that's where we were uh, in early March. And, you know, mathematically, that's very intuitive to somebody like me who studies the virus, but to experience that in real time was uh, strange and terrifying. And I very remember very clearly getting a call from a close friend and colleague who's an intensivist at Harborview saying that things had seemed very quiet for two days and then very quickly it seemed like uh, the, thing, the, the hospital was overflowing. And I really want to credit you, Governor Inslee, for, for uh, instituting the stay home, stay healthy policy right about that time, because I, I think had, had we not done that, uh, this could have easily looked a lot like New York, uh, even if we had waited a week or two. Um, and so that policy was very successful, and we ended up getting the reproductive number, which is defined as the number of people infected on average by a person who gets infected to about one. And amazingly, that is where we've been um, for, for many months now in, in our state and, and many other states. And what's important about that number is that it is first associated with some tragedy and sadness. They're, they're, you know, we're not at a place where zero people are dying per day, which would be optimal. But the other thing that's very important about that is that number represents a tipping point. And, and what I mean by that is that if things get slightly worse, so if people relax their physical distancing a little bit more, or they wear masks a little less frequently, the reproductive number goes up above one, the number of cases starts doubling every few days, and the deaths go up. And, and this is precisely what happened in several states uh, over the summer, uh, including Arizona and, and uh, Texas. And I fear it's what's happening in, in several other states uh, as we speak. And, and so we are not in a safe place. It, it may feel as if, you know, we're not seeing the hospitals overrun, but, but, but that's precisely where we are. The more optimistic take on this is that uh, there's a tipping point in the other direction. And that, that tipping point is that if we can get the reproductive number more in the neighborhood of 0.6, then, then we are in a place where the cases are low enough and where, where we can really start considering things uh, like opening schools. And so this is why the masking is, is so important. So let's, uh, I think, Governor, there were a couple of uh, slides you wanted me to share. You bet. Uh, and the first is, uh, picture of how, how we think masks work. And so what the panel on the left shows is, imagine you have two people and the first person is infected and the second person is not. We call this a transmission pair. The first person sheds the virus at a certain amount and they're most likely to transmit the virus uh, when the virus is at its highest level. Unfortunately, uh, usually the virus peaks at its highest level before people know they are infected, before they feel symptoms. And so that's one of the reasons we've had such a difficult time containing the virus across the globe. Now imagine one of those two people is wearing a mask, either the exposed person or the person who is a potential transmitter. What that does, and this is shown in the middle panel here, is it lowers the amount of virus that the exposed person is exposed to. And so it, masks are not perfect. This may not eliminate the possibility of a transmission, but it lowers the possibility. Now imagine a scenario where the transmitter and the exposed person are wearing a mask. And I'll remind you that the transmitter still doesn't know they're infected in this scenario. So both of these people think they're healthy and well. The exposure viral load goes down even more. So the benefit uh, is accrued at a much more powerful level. So it's making an imperfect intervention better. When you average this across the population, this is where the masks become incredibly powerful. So uh, the next slide, please. So this is something called a heat map that we love to use in mathematical modeling. And it looks complicated, but it's not so bad. So I'll walk you through this. So what each of the little squares is in the panel represents a scenario and a bad scenario is when R is greater than one. So that represents anything yellow or red. And good is purple or blue, meaning that our intervention has curbed the amount of spread to below one. And then right in the middle is one. 
And I'm, I would like to tell you that in the United States, most states are very much in this area of one. And so then we track on the x-axis how well we think a mask works when it's on an exposed person and how well we think a mask works when it's on a transmitter. And we follow those two together and we come to the middle of this black square. And so on the left, the panel signifies a situation which is I think about where we are in the most places in the United States where about three quarters of people are wearing a mask about three quarters of the time. And what you see is that here we're kind of blurring in from purple to orange. This is the area where we're kind of flirting with disaster. We're at this tipping point. We're on this tightrope where the reproductive number is just around one. If you look at the panel on the right, now you have everybody who walks outside wearing a mask 100% of the time. So this is Japan. This, this is, uh, you know, a, a very crowded country. And actually, this is many countries in Africa as well that, despite limited resources, have limited the spread of the virus. And what you can see is rather than flirting with one, the reproductive number uh, is, is in the neighborhood of anywhere from 0.4 to 0.8. And this depends on a lot of other things. But the point is, is just by boosting the mask use a little bit, by everybody teaming up and, and doing a good job, it makes everybody so much safer. Uh, and so I think really this, this should be our, our goal. Uh, and and that, that's, that's really the power of being. I'd, I'd like to, a couple of other points uh, before I, I finish. Uh, the first is that masks are not perfect as I stated. But one of the effects that the mask can have is say you are in a transmission pair and you're wearing a mask and the person you're exposed to is wearing a mask, but you still get infected. Our model very strongly suggests that the amount of virus that you would be exposed to is much less. And we think that that would make you much less likely to develop a severe version of COVID-19. So the masks are likely to benefit people even if they do get infected. The second point is that uh, Masks are not perfect. And so I think all of us have a tendency to, to take stories from our own life uh, and, and as anecdotes and say they're proof. But I, I think that what's very important to note is that if you are wearing a mask and you do get infected, it's not evidence that the mask didn't work. In fact, uh, it's possible that your sickness would have been worse had you not been wearing a mask. And if this were a part of a super spreading event, it's possible that the super spreading event would have been worse had people within that uh, scenario not been wearing a mask. And so it's very important to consider these things because again, it's not perfect. And because it's not perfect, everybody needs uh, to comply. So the, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, this morning, there was a fantastic symposium uh, shared by Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and the University of Washington in Seattle about the future of a vaccine. And speakers included Tony Fauci, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, Onsef Slaoui, who is uh, uh, in charge of Operation Warp Speed, and our own Larry Corey at the Hutch, the ex-president uh, and director of the Hutch. And I'll tell you, I was emerged from that very optimistic. I, I won't say that there will be an effective vaccine or when that will be, but that the best minds in the world are, are putting their energy into this and that I am very hopeful that there will be a uh, rollout of a vaccine in, you know, within the coming year. Uh, and and that, th that, you know, I'm just optimistic in general that that's a possibility. So the goal is to limit the number of cases and deaths between now and then. And I think that's how we'll be judged in the future. And so I'm, I'm just so happy to be a part of this and to help in any way I can. And uh, I'll stop there and, and uh, turn it back to the governor. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schiffer. Uh, the, the doctor has uh, shortly, but I, I know he'll welcome questions and we'll resume after that. If anyone have questions for Dr. Schiffer, uh, you can try them out. Go ahead, Joe. Doctor, you just sort of made a compelling case for mask or, or a comprehensive case, but how do you really um, convince people to get the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 percent of people that are skeptical about this and, and have been for many months now, regardless of what they've heard? How can you, how do you bring them over? 
Yeah, I think that, that it really depends on the scenario. I suspect that different people are, are uh, not wearing masks or not believing in masks for different reasons. Uh, I, I, I think all of these things tend to be local. So I would ask people who, I think you need to be patient. I don't, I don't think people respond to being uh, lectured to or, you know, really uh, spoken down to. But if you have a family member uh, or, uh, you know, or a close friend who, do, who doesn't believe in masks, I, I think the very s simple message is that you could very easily be protecting loved ones particularly people who are immunocompromised or elderly. Uh, and you can be, you could be protecting people you don't know. Uh, and, and I just think that that's such a powerful and compelling message. And importantly, there's just no evidence whatsoever that masks are harmful in any way. Joe, did you want to ask a follow-up? No, that's it. Thank you. Joe, if, hey. Joe, if I may just add one, one we, we have had considerable changes you know in yakima when they started to get hit by this big pandemic you know very very few people were wearing masks they got to like within 90 95 percent on some surveys done because the community pitched in together business leaders acted the chamber of commerce acted you know everybody got together and it changed dramatically just in a couple of weeks and so we do have confidence we can continue to uh, to be a bigger team here Okay, and our last question for this Q&A portion, we'll go to Keith Eldred with Kamu. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, Dr. Schiffer, and if the governor wants to chime in, uh, you were talking about the importance of masking up, but uh, how damaging is the fact that you have a president who takes off his mask in front of the entire world and says, we're learning to live with it, don't be afraid. How much harm has he been doing for your effort to get people to mask up? If I may, if I may uh, Dr. Schiffer, um, I'm not sure you get paid enough to answer this kind of question. Maybe you should leave it to me. <laughs> uh, if you want to, go ahead. But uh, I hate to put Dr. Schiffer in a difficult position. Uh, I think it's fine. I'll, I'll just briefly say it's, uh, we, you know, scientifically, we can't quantify the harm. And my group likes to model things. And it's impossible to know. But it's it's obviously just extremely disappointing to not model good behavior when you have such an opportunity to do so. Uh, and I do think the ripple effect is lost lives. I, I can't tell you how many, but it's uh, just very sad. Keith, did you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, wants to chime in on that. Uh, I'll have uh, more comments after, doc after we release Dr. Schiffer. That wraps that Q&A portion. Too. Okay, doctor, thank you very much. We appreciate you helping save Washington lives. Thank you very much. All right. Sure. Everybody luck. be well. Good luck. Good luck. Thank Good luck you very much. Very much. Uh, I have some more comments about masking, and then we're going to have our announcement, good news announcement today. Uh, you know, we are, we are uh, always happy when people show some signs of recovery from COVID, and it appears that the president may have some uh, some recovery, that'll be great. Uh, but I do I just have to express concerns. You know, we're in a moment in Washington State. We're fighting a pandemic. Uh, we've lost 2,000 of our family members, our fathers and mothers, brothers, sisters, grandparents. And we really need, we need everybody to pitch in, including the President of the United States, to help us through this difficult challenge. And, uh, and unfortunately, we ju we're just not getting it. Uh, we didn't get it at the beginning when he downplayed th this virus, uh, when he told us it was gonna go away the next Tuesday, when he refused to help us get PPE. And we're just not getting it now. And I, I gotta tell you, it's, it's very, very disappointing as, as the doctor alluded to. You know, last night when he stood on the balcony for his photo opportunity, we know he wanted to project strength. And as I've indicated, what can project strength is to help save lives. Saving lives is what's really strong. And when he has continued to downplay the importance of masks, that's really dangerous. And I just have to tell you what's so troublesome to me. When he was standing on that balcony, um, you can look out 
towards the Washington Monument. And if you looked out there, you, this is what you'd see last night. 20,000 chairs around the Washington Monument. You can see that from the South Balcony. And those 20,000 chairs, each one represents 10 deceased Americans killed by the COVID virus. Over 200,000 people represented by that. And how anyone could look out on the representation of 200,000 deceased Americans and belittle the, the threat that this virus poses to try to tell Americans not to be concerned about this and then do whatever, everything he can instead of modeling good behavior to model dangerous behavior, that's just not performing the duties of the president to us in the state of Washington. And this is really dangerous. We've seen a super spreader event at the White House, apparently. Even the Joint Chiefs of Staff today are quarantined. This is perhaps not just a public health concern. At that point, it becomes a national security concern. And the reason that's doubly disappointing is that the president told us that he had learned from this. And obviously, he has not. Instead, he's ramping up his deception in a last-ditch effort because of his electoral prospects. It's just very disappointing. And what we have to do is, is compensate for that as leaders, and we can all be leaders as business people and employees and churchgoers. And we can all be leaders here. We, we all need to be leaders here. By the way, these small things, one of the interesting things I was thinking about when I was listening to the doctor you know, you might, it might seem a small thing just to put on a mask. You, you kind of go like, well, what's one person? What difference is it going to make? Well, it could make somebody's life, and then that person could be two lives, and that person could be four lives. And it's kind of like little things make a difference. They make a difference in teams. Look, Seattle Seahawks starting 4-0, and Seattle Storm playing for the championship. And they got to be champions by doing little things. And if we do these little things... We're going to continue to open up our economy. A comment also about D.C. We're disappointed in the president's uh, pulling the plug on discussions to help our state. It's very disappointing that he has decided to uh, try to ram through a Supreme Court justice in his goal to eliminate health care for two, about 800,000 Washingtonians in the middle of a pandemic instead of actually trying to help us with our financial constraints, very disappointing. But we will soldier, soldier on. Now, turning to the good part of this, <laughs> or the happy part of this uh, discussion, I'm really pleased to say that our, our efforts are showing progress. And we're announcing today some fairly significant new steps to allow us to return to our healthy practices in sports and youth activities as well as quite a number of our businesses. Uh, we have John Wiesman and Nick Struley here to answer questions about that. So uh, we have shown progress because we have masked up. And as a result, we are rolling out some new protocols to allow people uh, to start playing sports again and to allow many businesses to start getting back into business. Uh, let's start with youth sports. Uh, we know that some tournaments may still be restricted. But today we're announcing that we're allowing more school and non-school sports, both indoor and outdoors. Uh, according to the local metrics, according to the type of sports, and we have now found a way, we believe we can do this reasonably safely. The individual sports are going to be based on the metrics of the county and the risk factor involved in those sports. But I got to tell you, as the son of a coach and an athletic director, I'm really, really happy that we're going to have our kids be able to go back and play soccer, uh, go back and play softball, go back and run in cross country, play tennis, play flag football, play lacrosse. This is a really good day for our young people to get back in these really healthy activities. And we've been able to do this because we've worked very closely with coaches and athletic directors and schools and nonprofits to be able to develop the protocols to allow our students to be able to do this safely. We know this has been a tough time for our kids, 
and being able to get them back on the field to play with their friends, uh, have a good relationship with their coaches, and always treat referees and umpires with uh, respect most of the time. And we hope that that's going to be a really good experience for our kids. Now, we're going to do some other things, too, for our businesses. And it's not just businesses that will benefit. We will. Uh, we have a new um, uh, rules that will allow uh, movie theaters to open up, libraries to open up, wedding receptions to open up, real estate activities to open up, and some outdoor recreation. We'll make some changes that the cutoff for uh, alcohol in restaurants will be advanced to 11 p.m. from 10 p.m. We are also allowing greater capacity at tables in phases two and three. And we are eliminating the restriction that was in place that required you to only dine with people in your household. We are hopeful this is going to allow uh, restaurants to boost business and in a safe way. We're opening libraries for indoor operations in phase two at 25% capacity. Realtors can host open houses again as long as they're consistent with the county's uh, gathering size limits. And for youth sports, we're applying metrics to determine the risk associated with each activity and when they can resume. So we're doing this because we want to recognize the progress we've made. We want to celebrate it. And we hope that this will, <clears throat> this will show an incentive for our increasing uh, desire to do the things that work, which includes wearing masks. Because here in Washington, we know this, uh, this risk is real. It is something to be concerned about and that we have a weapon against it. We only have really uh, two weapons against it and we got to use both social distancing and wearing masks. We look forward to the availability of a vaccine, but until then, we've got to fight this war with the tools we have and the weapons we have and that's a mask and social distancing. And what aircraft carriers were in World War II, a mask is today. And we're not going to accept the unilateral disarmament, frankly, that the president has called for. We're going to win this battle. So with that, happy to uh, stand for questions. All right. Up first, up first, we'll go to Rachel LaCourt with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Governor, if you're confident enough to make these changes that are announced today, why not unpause the phases that the counties are currently in? Well, we wanted to do targeted things where we can show how to do this in a safe way. I think increasingly the way we need to think about this is not just so much as prohibitions about what you can't do, but adaptations to show how we do something safely. And so we think we've been able, by working with the communities, to develop ways to do these things safely. And we expect that that effort will continue so that as we've figured out a way for kids to play soccer safely, let's get them to do it. As we have figured out a ways to open up theaters and I think probably 85% of the state, let's do it safely. And so what we're doing is taking a very targeted approach based on science, based on the business needs and listening to the community. We hope that's going to continue. Now it's dependent on our ability to continue to drive these numbers down. And so far in the last two months, we've opened up quite a number of our business activities by doing it this way. And I wanna, th I wanna thank the business leaders that we have worked with to, uh, to develop these protocols. We think it's been really a productive uh, conversations. Rachel, did you wanna ask a follow-up? Yes. Yeah, so are we moving away then from the county phase process to this more targeted approach for businesses? Well, today we have, but we are constantly looking at these phases to see if there's ways that we can use new science to make them more effective. Now, I have to express uh, a challenge. This is a challenge because counties are changing. They're going up, they're going down. And to some degree, no one wants to go backwards in a phase, I, I can guarantee you that. Uh, and so if we change the phase numbers, it could end up with some counties going backwards. I know that they are not would not be happy about that situation. So at the moment, this is what we're doing, but we are always looking at these opportunities to bring more science into this 
into this uh, equation, and that includes potential changes in the in the phasing uh, system that we use. All right. Next, we'll go to Joe Sullivan with Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Governor, given that um, people congregating around alcohol at night uh, has, has been a, a problem during the pandemic from uh, your own orders back in March, it, it sort of spurred uh, your strict uh, lockdown early on um, to uh, caseloads rising around the country. Um, throughout the pandemic, are you confident that uh, you can shift uh, alcohol sales up to 11 p.m. and loosen some of these restrictions in, in restaurants without seeing a rise in cases? Uh, I think there is a reason to believe that's a distinct possibility, and we are going to try this. We believe that if we continue to increase our use of masks, and we hope that we're heading in that direction, that will allow us to make these shifts to allow more social interactions. So if you look at this, is we, we, we've got tools available to us. One is to reduce social interactions. The other is to wear masks. If we increase the use of this tool wearing masks, we can reduce our use or necessity or reliance on the other tool, which is social distancing. That means we can get together more. So we are hopeful in part by taking these steps, this will encourage people to wear masks, to understand this relationship, to be responsible. Now, if folks are not, you know, um, we can't guarantee success, but we can guarantee that we follow science here and we hope more, more Washingtonians will of, of all parties. Joe, did you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, no, thank you. All right. Next, we'll go to Keith Eldridge with Como. Go ahead, Keith. Governor, you were talking about opening up sports. Is high school football and that kind of thing going to be opened up as well? Well, mostly my understanding is in, in most uh, counties not because it is considered a high risk. What, what we have done is done a, an analysis of the risk associated with each kind of sport. Football is a higher risk because it has more close facial interactions as for reasons we can understand. And at, the, at least at the moment, we haven't found a way to develop the protocols that could really keep our young people safe during that sport. And by the way, it's just not just the young people, it's their parents when they go home and it's their grandparents and everybody else in the community that has a risk here. So we haven't found a way to do that uh, uh, at this date. Uh, we think that there has been a way to be found in the professional level and college level because frankly, they have the financing that can do all of the, you know, dozens of things that they've been able to do with constant testing and and putting people in pods and constant evaluation. The schools just cannot afford that uh, to do what the Seahawks are doing right now. So we'll continue to look at this, to, to listen to people, but at the moment, we don't think that that's, uh, that's in the cards. Did you have a follow-up? I do want to, I do want to, if I may, uh, we're, you know, at the moment, the WIA, and that's the group that makes the decision here, I, I actually have not made this decision. We, we have not made that particular decision specifically. But the WIA, I'm told, has planning for a tackle football uh, season uh, next year. And that'll be great if that happens. I think it's reasonable to have a planning a plan in that dimension. And I'm pleased. We'd love to have these... Folks playing football, it's a lot of fun. And we understand they like to get college scholarships. And we hope that they're gonna have great games as soon as they can. Keith, did you wanna ask a follow-up? The Senate and House Republicans again are asking for a special session to deal with Boeing, getting kids back into school. Are you gonna call one? No, I haven't seen any new news on that. Uh, they still are insisting on taking away people's health insurance with Donald Trump. Uh, they have not offered any any real suggestion on aerospace. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to, we aren't going to allow them to cut mental health and, and homelessness efforts. And fortunately, the decisions we've made, I've been able to make, have been vindicated by the last couple of months. Um, I have made reductions of about a, over half a billion dollars in state spending. And we've got a four and a half billion dollar bump in our revenue forecast. 
So they have been calling for that since day one, but we now, because they thought we could not get through this biennium. Well, that turns out that's not case. And that is not the case. There is no reason for a special session right now involving this biennium. We're going to get through it in part because of the responsible things that I have done, uh, cutting uh, raises, doing furloughs, doing a hiring freeze, together with the new revenue that has appeared. So there's really no reason for that right now, except they continue to want to cut health care. That's just not going to happen on my watch. In, by the way, in the middle of a pandemic, now, if I may be marginally um, critical of the, the Trump party who still wants to cut health care, who wants to eliminate health care in the middle of a pandemic and expose people if you get COVID, you now will not have protection, protection against a denial for a pre-existing condition. That's what the Trump party wants to do. And we just cannot think that's a wise move when we have had 200,000 dead in America and hundreds of thousands infected. So no, I don't think a special session would be helpful right now. All right, next we'll go to Jerry Cornfield with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, Governor, not able to see all the details on the protocol, so I'm wondering, um, will crowds be allowed to attend any of the college or pro sporting events under the changes or any of it at this point? Nick, could you Nick, uh, handle that question, please? please. I'd be happy to, Governor. Thank you. Uh, spectators are, are still prohibited at the pro sporting and college sporting events. And our guidance today is really aimed at youth sports and some of the adult recreational sports. And similarly, spectators will mostly be prohibited at those aside from if, if you need uh, an adult, you know, a single adult supervision to, to watch over a youth sporting event. But for the most part, spectators not allowed. Jerry, did you want to ask a follow up? Yes, please. Uh, and then, Governor, I just want to make sure I understand the the cases, the number of cases are rising across the state and in Snohomish County and other places. Um, and you're making this decision today. So, are you? Why again? Are you making these changes with the data showing an increase in cases? Well, uh, it's because we think it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do because we have found a way to do these things safely with minimal risk. And because we have developed these custom made protocols for individual sports, individual businesses, and because we've all worked together and we have all worked together, restaurant owners, youth sports, coaches, we've been able to design these ways to do these things safely. And we've learned about this virus and we have learned about how businesses are responding and they're finding some creative ways to reduce the risk. And so we've been able to do that. Now we are hopeful that the recent uptick in the numbers have been caused by one-time events, Labor Day and perhaps the smoke, that we kept us inside more and we think those might be one-time events. We hope they are so we can get back on the track of knocking these numbers down again. But obviously, we're going to watch this uh, very, very carefully. And if I may, I just want to just um, look, these have been really, really hard times for people. It's been really hard on our kids, although they're pretty resilient. And uh, to get them back playing is a real joy. I think just for a moment in these hard times, it might be fair to let us experience just a little bit of joy and happiness. I have to tell you, I do. Uh, my dad's birthday was yesterday, if he was still with us, and he always talked about the thing that he even thought even more than school was really Bill's character and Bill's confidence, Bill's uh, integrity was participation in, in sports. He was a coach, basketball and track, and I actually agree with him. I, you know, I benefited from that, having some, getting it in my old playing days. So this is a day of some joy in my book and um, shoot, maybe my dad would have been proud of me today. I don't know. All right, next we'll go to Alexis Krall with the News Tribune. Go ahead, Alexis. Governor, 
Governor, with ongoing news about the vaccine approval process and allegations of political interference, do you have confidence at this point that vaccines that are approved will be safe and effective? Uh, if the FDA prevails, if the CDC prevails in this arm wrestling match with the president, if he fails in politicizing, if he fails in his effort to politicize these decisions, then I think we'll be in good shape. But he has hurt this effort uh, uh, by creating doubt about that because he has tried to lean on these scientific community. And that has unfortunately uh, decreased some folks' confidence in the system. So I would say we should continue to hope for the best, but we need to be vocal to prevent uh, Donald Trump from continuing his effort to politicize this. Now here's the, the good news. We are going to have an independent evaluation of the clinical trials by the state of Washington. Uh, we are now pursuing the right mechanism for doing that. There may be some announcements forthcoming on some uh, institutions that are uh, looking at this issue. So we will have a very independent assessment of the clinical trials. We'll be able to look at the data and the reason I'm confident in that is that the vaccine manufacturers have already been really transparent. They've done what they've never done before. They have never shared their protocols before during a clinical trial. So I'm confident they will share with us the results of the clinical trial. We will be able to look at those numbers. We will have our epidemiologists and infections control. And of course, we have the best ones in the world right here in Washington State. So we'll be able to make our independent assessment. And if, you know, if these vaccines don't pass our standards, you know, uh, we'll insist on, on better results. So I feel good in that sense. We might have to do some work ourselves, but we certainly are up to it. John, you want to add anything? No, I just think, uh, Governor, you said it well, and there was a symposium today with the University of Washington and Johns Hopkins University that our health officer, Kathy Lofi, uh, participated in and listened to. And uh, we're anxious to hear what happened there today and uh, uh, understand uh, the path forward. So um, appreciate, Governor, your support for this. Yeah, if I can, just the, the bottom line is, if a vaccine is, is distributed in the state of Washington, it's going to be a safe vaccine. We will see to that. It's very important. We understand our health is involved. So I am very confident about that. It make it easier if the president keeps his mitts off the FDA, but one way or another, we're gonna succeed. Alexis, did you wanna ask a follow-up question? Uh, yes, please. I'm wondering about the landlord-tenant working group you announced in July, Governor, and if they've made any recommendations to you with the uh, moratorium set to end next week. Uh, not yet, and I, uh, we have not made decisions about that. We obviously will share it with you as soon as we do. Okay. Right. Up next, we'll go to Mayor Kawash with KXLY. Go ahead. Hi, Governor. As we see some restrictions lifted today and as we are on the verge of flu season, if cases do start to get out of hand, what's the plan uh, when it comes to this phased reopening? Well, uh, you know, engaging in speculation is always a problem. But what I would say is if that were to happen, we would we would hope that Washingtonians would respond to that by increasing mask usage and increasing social distancing. And what we have found is there is more room to improve. You know, some good news here is we haven't maxed out our use of this tool yet, right? So we're not, we haven't gone to the top of the gauge here in the red line. We still have room to improve. That's the good news. And what we have found, in fact, other states have found is that as new bad news has come in, citizens have been willing because they start to see the bad news and you go, well, maybe there is a problem here. Maybe I should mask up. And that actually has happened. So what, is, what has happened is when you've seen an explosion in New York or increases in Arizona or Florida, suddenly the people who said, well, I don't want to wear a mask, Donald Trump doesn't wear a mask, and suddenly you're seeing people in gurneys in ER rooms, people start wearing masks. And so you then start driving down these numbers. Now, we don't want to get in that position, but there's kind of a self-correcting dial here that, you know, 
you might, some folks might want to make a political statement about a mask until people start dying. Then they change their behavior. So we hope that it doesn't come to that. We are making progress, and uh, I'm happy that that's the case. Mayor, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, and just the, the timing of this, um, obviously coming about a month after Labor Day, does that mean you guys feel confident about the surge that has come from Labor Day, that it may be near the end? John, do you want to address that? I think as the governor said earlier, we're paying close attention to the numbers and trying to understand um, what they all mean. We've had a number of things happen sort of all at once. Um, Labor Day, as you mentioned, uh, more people spending time indoor due to the uh, smoke events. We have universities who are returning um, and we're really uh, pleading with those students to follow these kinds of things that we are talking about, uh, masking up and social distancing and not gathering in our social uh, um, communities. Uh, we also had some delays, I think, in testing because uh, some of the testing sites were um, closed in those community sites during the the weather, uh, the smog uh, that was with that. And so we're factoring all of those things in. And I think uh, paying careful attention to the numbers. Um, the good news is that we're not seeing an increase in, in, in COVID-like um, um, uh, illness in our emergency rooms. So again, uh, as the governor's pointed out many times, we look at many pieces of data to sort of sort through uh, what we think is happening. So we're going to keep a close eye on the numbers, um, and we need everybody to do wear the masks, wash your hands, and watch your distance. And if we can all do that together and continue to double down on that, um, our hope is that we will see these numbers come back down uh, really quickly. Uh, John, I appreciate you bringing up uh, colleges just for a moment. We are experiencing an outbreak at the University of Washington in the fraternity and sorority uh, system. It's very concerning. And uh, we just have to ask the students there to really step up to the plate and lead. And that can be hard. When I was a college freshman, I remember staying up a lot of late nights, uh, having both sessions, uh, talking about how ridiculously ignorant uh, their parents and grandparents were. And that's really enjoyable. But those con conclaves of five and six and seven college students at a fraternity right now not wearing masks within six feet is just deadly right now. So we have to ask, are these students at the fraternities and sororities of the University of Washington, please help out the state of Washington. Please help your parents. You just got to accept this for some period of time. The happy days are going to come when you can socialize to your heart's content. But right now, we just really need you to help us out. Next, we'll go to Jim Camden with a spokesman review. Go ahead, Jim. Governor, I'm, I'm wondering if this independent evaluation of the vaccine trials means that uh, before a vaccine is allowed to be distributed in Washington, even if it's being distributed elsewhere in the country, uh, people, Washington, Washington residents wouldn't get that. And, and how would that work? Well, I believe this is not going to be a problem. I'll just tell you what I believe. I believe that the scientific community is strong enough, robust enough, and determined enough to not allow Donald Trump to endanger the lives of citizens. We have seen quite a bit of evidence of that. The vaccine manufacturers themselves have opened up their books and their protocols. They have never done this before because they understand how important this is to have people's trust in the system. The FDA uh, personnel have said repeatedly, we are not going to approve a vaccine if it's not safe. We're just not going to do it. And I think those uh, the scientists and the doctors are showing some spine here, and they need it. So I believe that spine is going to be successful. Now, we may have, if we see some any evidence that Donald Trump has succeeded in his madness of exposing us to risk, we'll make sure that this independent uh, evaluation is done and, and that it's successful. So again, what I'm saying is, one way or another, our people are going to be safe. John, do you want to add anything? 
Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, we are carefully watching the advisory committee on immunization practices, uh, not watching and like watching over them. But again, another group of independent scientists who are looking at the data who make recommendations to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, we're watching um, all of those and following that. I agree with the governor that um, the scientists are there. Uh, they know the protocols that need to be followed. Uh, the um, pharmaceutical companies in this case uh, know the risks, I think, that are there and want um, a product that's going to be safe. So like the governor, I'm confident we're going to come out um, uh, on the other side uh, with something uh, that is safe as long as um, these, these prevail, um, as they should. Um, as they have in other um, um, other products that have been developed and uh, received FDA approval. Bottom line, Donald Trump uh, cares about his election, and he's in a tussle with the entire medical and scientific community of the United States of America. And on that tussle, the medical community and the scientific community that cares about the health of Americans is going to win. Jim, did you want to ask a follow-up? Uh, yes, yes. On, on another tussle um, regarding post-COVID relief, it looks like that's not going to come until after the election. What are your forecasters telling you to expect in Washington? How rough it's going to be if we don't get uh, more COVID relief for, for another month or so? Well, the good news is, is we are okay this biennium. The, there is no need for a special session. As I said, because I've already done the cuts as the executive officer of the state, and we've had a four and a half billion dollars uh, come in. So that together with our reserve fund, we're just fine for the current biennium. We do not need a special session. But we still have a four to four and a half billion dollar uh, deficit in, in the upcoming biennium. And we'll just have to figure out and make the right decisions at the right time how to handle that. And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that after the election, um, you know, still, there is still hope that we could still get some federal assistance. I hope that will be the case. That does happen on occasion when people have a chance to think about the health of and safety of their constituents uh, without the pressures of an election. Wonderful things sometimes can happen. So we, we still retain hope in that regard. One more question. Right. Last question will go to Esme Jimenez with KUOW. Go ahead. Esme, are you still there? Esme? Esme? Going once. Is that you? Can you hear us? How does that sound? Perfect. Perfect. Great, great. Okay. okay, sorry about that. I had a question about um, the no restrictions on household members dining together indoors. My latest understanding is that the CDC reports that adults with positive COVID tests were twice as likely to have reported dining at a restaurant. So I'm curious why why limit those or yeah why remove the restriction? Well, well, mostly because we found out restaurants were not totally abiding by this and not really enforcing it. So we don't think there's been much loss in COVID transmission reduction. And we are very hopeful, as I've said, as more people wear masks in the state of Washington, it allows us to, to allow more social interactions. More people are wearing masks in the state of Washington. Thankfully, the vast majority of Washingtonians are ignoring Donald Trump on this subject. And so as a result of that, we are able to use this tool and open up some of the social interactions. We hope to continue that direction. And uh, I feel good about that. I guess I'm just curious, since my understanding of what you just said is it felt, it felt like restaurants couldn't actually follow this protocol anyway, so you're kind of giving up on it? Well, we don't give well, up we don't on anything because we're so resilient in the state of Washington. But what we concluded is that, that we were really not getting much reduction of transmissions from this policy, bottom line, and it was aggravating to people and was not reducing transmissions one way or another. So this was a rational choice. But again, I want to reiterate our ability to do these things is dependent on folks masking up. And I, I do want to add this too, because I think it's important. Masks are important anytime you are with another person. 
particularly inside, anytime. That includes when you're watching a Seahawk game, when you have friends over for coffee, uh, any so a birthday party. Masks are important in all those contexts. The reason I say this is we think we need to take masks to the second step. So we've done the first step. People, when they're going to businesses, when they're shopping, vast majority of people are complying and wearing masks. But where we have not got as much help is where we need it, frankly, is in our homes. And it's so easy to kind of have a false sense of security in a home. I, I certainly feel that myself. It's your home. What could go wrong? And so you let your guard down. You have a Seahawks party. And, and then you get infections. I read about this family um, in, in Malden. I just felt so terrible for them. A family of five or seven, I think. And their house burned down in Malden. And they went to dinner with another family. And boom, all I think it was all seven of the family are now have COVID. And that's the kind of thing that we just, we really are trying to avoid. So the second step of the mass campaign we are now starting. And we are going to have a communication plan to share this information with Washingtonians. You've seen it on TV and radio. It's been quite successful. Um, and we're going to uh, continue that to show people how to have social interactions. How do we enjoy the Seahawks without infecting each other? There's a way to do that. It involves a little social distance and masking. And so we want to help people understand how to do it in a safe way. But that includes in our homes. That's where the new front is. And we hope to win that uh, on that front as well. No, oh, thank no. you very much. Uh, I certainly look forward. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, first um, women's soccer player uh, to score a goal as a result of this policy to um, uh, send me an email, and they are going to get the governor's uh, trophy for helping lead this uh, athletic renaissance. I'm looking forward to see who it is. I hope it's somebody from Ingram High School, but we'll see. Thanks a lot, mascot.